B'Shem Hashem Naseh V'Natzliach, Shir Torah, Bukhim Abayim. We are back here on our Wednesday night, Stump the Rabbi, where after some Divret Torah, you guys will, uh, B'Zad Hashem, ask some questions. HaKadosh Baruch Hu will give us the answers. And B'Zad Hashem will get closer and closer to serving HaKadosh Baruch Hu at the uh, most extraordinary way, full of Mesirut Nefesh. Tonight's Shir is going to be for the Refua Shlema and Atzlacha Rabba for... Uh, Rav Ephraim ben Shulamit, Rabbanit Sarah bat Anat, Rabbanit Levana bat Sarah, Avi Mori David ben Nesriya, Imi Morati Doris bat Jora. Um, and what else do we have? Uh, Sarah bat Levana, Ovadia ben Levana, Yosef ben Levana, and all of Am Yisrael, Bezot Hashem, and all the righteous Noahais that continue to uh, watch our uh, lectures, share them, learn from them, apply them, and support our organization in uh, any way that uh, they can. Anyone that wants to donate uh, and help us, especially now before the end of the uh, cyclical year uh, for, for tax purposes, or even simply to just add more mitzvot, uh, can go to uh, our website, uh or you can actually go to bhtorah.org, or you can go to our uh, new campaign or really ongoing campaign that's being relaunched bhyeshiva.com, uh, which we'll discuss Be'ezat Hashem later today, since we have Parashat Vayechi, that uh, is full, full of uh, pearls and diamonds of wisdom uh, of how to make a deal, uh, you know, a deal that's worth doing. And of course, anyone that has uh, reviewed the words of the sages knows that when you watch a shiur Torah, it's a, uh, it's, you're, you're getting, that's a good shiur Torah, it's divrei lokim chaim, it's the words of the living God. Kadosh Baruch Hu gives the speaker the right words to say, and if you uh, have the uh, benefit of uh, attending our main event that we're going to have uh, uh, on January 10th, uh, then uh, you'll also have the benefit of saying Kaddish with us. Now what's the difference of saying Kaddish uh, at the end of a shiur? Uh, versus uh, just watching it online, for those of you that uh, don't know. Um, the Yalkut Yosef in Ilchot Kaddish, in uh, Siman 56, uh, brings the Gemara in Masechet Sota, page 49a, and he says, in the name of Rabban, Shim, uh, Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel, who brought the teachings of Rabbi Yoshua, he says that since the day that the Bet HaMikdash was destroyed, not a day passes without a curse. And even a dew does not deliver its blessings. And if so, on what merit does the world continue to exist? In so many words, the sages are asking, why is the world still here? Since there's so many problems... There's terrorisms, there's pogroms, there's inquisitions, there's blood libels, there's poverty, there's sickness, there's more and more curses. And we don't have the Bet HaMikdash. We don't have the prophets. We don't have the ability that we had at the time of the Bet HaMikdash. On what merit does this world exist? Says Rabbi Yeshua, says Rabbi Yeshua, it exists because of the Kedusha. That's recited in Uvalet Zion, in the prayer of Uvalet Zion, and also the response of Yehe Shemer Rabba that's recited after a lecture of Haggadah. Here, Rabbi Yoshua gives a chidush of all chidushim about Kaddish. When you listen to Kaddish at your Bet Knesset, at your Bet Midrash, it's all good. You're sanctifying a Kadosh Baruch Hu's name. But if you listen to a shiur Torah that's full of agada, and for those people that think that agada, that midrashim, are really uh, you know something you shouldn't uh, spend your time on, you should know. The Gemara says the world exists because of that kaddish. The world exists. The atoms continue spinning. People continue breathing, seeing, hearing. Why? Because of the Kaddish at the end of a shiur Torah. But this could only be in a live shiur. We can't do a Kaddish at the end of a shiur Torah when I'm doing with you guys online. So Bezrat Hashem, we're going to be having a live shiur. Baruch Hashem, we have 
uh, quite a few people that have already signed up. I think it's somewhere around 100 people have already signed up. And uh, Bezat Hashem, next week we're going to be uh, announcing the location here in uh, South Florida. We're finalizing details right now with the venue. And uh, this event is going to give not only a lot of chizuk to those people that attend and those people that view it around the world, but also it's going to give each and every single one of us the ability to give the world more time to exist. Now, if a person understands the value of a Kaddish, up to here is already enough. But in case a person still doesn't understand, Rav Yitzchak Yosef Sheikhyeh brings more insights in Siman 56, where he says, in the name of the Bet Yosef, who teaches that Rabbi Elazar, the son of Rabbi Yosef, one day said that he was walking along the road and he saw Eliyahu Navi. But Eliyahu Navi wasn't walking by himself. Rather, Eliyahu Navi was walking with 4,000 camels, carrying full loads. And he says to Eliyahu, what are these camels, 4,000 camels? Imagine the massive scene here. What are these camels carrying? Says Eliyahu Navi, they're carrying God's wrath. Akadosh Baruch Hu's wrath and fury with which to punish those people who speak between Kaddish and Baruch Hu in the prayer or between two related blessings or between two passages of prayer or between Amen Yesh that's in the Kaddish and the words of Itbarach. Here Eliyahu Anavi gives us one of the scariest pictures a person can ever imagine where he's literally tasked with the assignment of carrying a Kadosh Baruch Hu's wrath to punish specific people that do not understand the value of Kaddish to the extent where they talk during Kaddish. So if a person has the ability to say Amen, Amen Yeshem Arabah during Kaddish, that's already a big thing. But furthermore, we already learned that if a person has the ability to say Amen Yeshem Arabah at the end of a lecture that spoke Midrashim, Agadot, Divrei Emet, they not only have sanctified HaKadosh Baruch Hu's name, but they literally gave the world the right to exist. Parashat Vayechi is full of pearls and wisdom that will help us understand even more about how a Kadosh Baruch Hu runs his world. Because if a person knows how the conductor conducts his dealings, how Hashem runs his world, he's assured that the instructions are going to be the best thing that he ever got because he can follow them now to the T and benefit from knowing what the end looks like. Pashat Vayechi culminates the story of the 12 tribes now living in Egypt. Yosef, the viceroy, has put Egypt on the map and has turned them from a country that was barely surviving and on the verge of disaster into the most thriving, successful, and powerful country in history. Yosef HaTzadik has not only succeeded uh, in material wealth, but also succeeded with wisdom and spirituality, elevating himself to the point where HaKadosh Baruch Hu calls him Yosef HaTzadik. But was this just something that happened to Yosef and nothing that we can benefit from? Quite the opposite. When Yaakov Avinu, Yaakov who was beloved by HaKadosh Baruch Hu to such an extent that HaKadosh Baruch Hu put 
the image of Yaakov on his kiseh kavod, on his throne of glory. If anyone has ever seen the throne of glory of a Kadosh Baruch Hu, they would see the image of Yaakov on it, alongside the kings of the animals, the king of the birds, the eagle, the ox, and the lion. And then the king of humans, in essence, has the image of Yaakov. That's how much HaKadosh Baruch Hu loved Yaakov. And Yaakov is completing his life in this world after spending 17 years in Egypt. But he wants to make sure that before he leaves, he makes one final deal. And he says to his son Yosef, Yaakov says to his son Yosef, if I have found favor in your eyes, meaning if you love me, please place your hand under my thigh and do chesed ve'emet, kindness and truth with me. Please do not bury me in Egypt. Now, we know the Midrash that says, and the Gemara that says that Yaakov did not want to be buried in Egypt because he did not want the idol-worshipping Egyptians to turn him into a god, into a false god. But we see that Yaakov is using familiar language here that we heard before. He's asking Yosef, to do chesed ve'emet with him, kindness and truth with him. Where else did we hear this? In the book of Genesis, chapter 32, verse 11, Yaakov Avinu says to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Katonti mikol hachasadim mikol ha'emet. Katonti mikol hachasadim mikol ha'emet, says Yaakov, where he's telling HaKadosh Baruch Hu, I have been diminished by all of the kindness and by all of the truth that you have done your servant. Meaning that, although I need your help, I want your help, I also know that you've already given me much more than the merits that I've earned. As good as Yaakov was, and as much good as he did, and as holy as he was, he knew that HaKadosh Baruch Hu already blessed him beyond his merits. Such is the mindset and the perspective of the righteous, where the more righteous they are, the more they realize how kind HaKadosh Baruch Hu has already been to to, uh, with them despite the way it looks like to other people from the outside of whether they're suffering they're struggling they're successful whatever it is they already know that whatever they have regardless of what the package looks like it's well beyond what they actually have earned but Yaakov is telling the same thing to Yosef in essence he's telling Yosef that make this deal with me. Make this deal with me and do kindness and truth with me. Why is this the case? He's telling Yosef, Yosef, you didn't just appear here. This is all from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And the reason why you succeeded the reason why you're in a position that you are is because of where we came from HaKadosh Baruch Hu spoke to Avraham my grandfather your great grandfather and he made promises to him if we follow his Torah we will be blessed. And those who bless us will also be blessed. 
those who curse us will be cursed. In order for you and your descendants to continue having that blessing, you have to continue what you've been doing and ensure that your children and grandchildren do the same. The sages teach us that the greatest chesed, the greatest kindness that one can ask, that one can give to another is depends on the person's circumstance. If the person that you want to do kindness with has died, you can do mitzvot for them. Especially support Kiruv, support Torah in their name. There's nothing greater in the world that you can do for someone that has died than to support Kiruv in their name. Because you're not only doing a mitzvah that goes to their account, which could also go to yours as well. You don't just do it in their name, you do it in their name, but also to your merit. A mitzvah is like fire. No matter how many other fires you light with that fire, the original fire stays the same. But not only can you do your grandfather, your grandmother, your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, whoever you love, a great kindness by investing into something good, but when you invest into Kirub specifically, you're giving them a spiritual investment, a spiritual stock, if you will, that only goes higher. Forever. Because every single mitzvah that that money will bring where you invest X amount of money. You want to invest a thousand, ten thousand, a hundred thousand, whatever it is. That money is used to help people do tshuva, to give lectures like this, to do events, to publicize books and USBs and all types of material to help people get closer to Hashem, keep Shabbat, keep family purity, abandon their wicked ways, and so on. Every single mitzvah that person does goes to your account, goes to that loved one's account. Now they get married, they encourage their family to do to also do tshuva, to also keep the Torah and mitzvot. Their mitzvot also go to your account and your loved one's account. They get married, they produce a family, they continue keeping the ways of Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, all of their mitzvot also go to your and your loved one's account. In so many words, if you invest into the right place that actually produces Baalei Tshuva, and they use that money to actually produce Baalei Tshuva, and not just simply to buy more houses, and not just simply to buy more watches, but they actually use the money to help people do tshuva, they use the money to help people learn Torah, then your spiritual account has an investment in it that never stops going higher. You have done a kindness to your loved one that literally cannot be matched by anything else. Now, if you want to do a kindness, if you want to do a kindness to someone else, you want to do a kindness to another fellow in the world, another woman, another man in the world. Then you have to do the kindness of emet, which is you have to tell them the truth about the will of Hashem to get them to do tshuva. Disregard their lack of interest, lack of... Uh, uh, anything else tell them what HaKadosh Baruch says how? share these lectures don't speak to them share with them why? because if you speak to them they'll feel more times than not intimidated that you are perhaps maybe talking down to them or at least that would be their perspective they remember you before you did tshuva or you've been from your whole life and they left the way and they feel like maybe you think you're better than them, the best thing to do is to give them a lecture, to give them one of the videos, one of the films we've done and watch it together with them. If you can't watch it together with them, send it to them once, twice a week. 
and you'll see that that chesed and emit that Yaakov is talking about, that's being given to a fellow Jew that's out there, a fellow human that's out there, will bring fruits. Now, there's no guarantee of success with every single person, and especially not on day one. But if you make Kiruv your number one priority in your life, aside from learning Torah, your success will be exponentially higher than you could ever imagine. Now what if a person wants to do chesed with himself? Wants to do kindness with himself? Then of course, they themselves have to apply the emet to themselves, the truth to themselves. Learn the Torah, follow the Torah, abandon all of the wicked ways that are against the Torah. But also, they have to appreciate and value the Torah by fulfilling the mitzvah of this is my God and I will glorify him making sure that all of their tools that they need to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu are the best they possibly be whether it's the tefillin or it's the mezuzah or it's the talit tzitzit, etrog, lulav your Shabbat clothes, your different things that you need for, Shabbat, for, for Shabbat, to light the candles, the candelabra, the Hanukkah menorah, all of these things should be the best that you can afford. Why? Because if you have tefillin that you got at Bar Mitzvah, but now you're no longer 13, you're more like 33 or 43. I could assure you that in Shemaim, when you put on tefillin, nothing is shaking. No one says in Shemaim, oh, look at this, look at this guy. He's really happy to put on tefillin. Why? He's not even willing to spell, spend a couple of thousand dollars on tefillin. He's still using the tefillin that he got from his Ima and Abba 20, 30 years ago. It's a complete disgrace when you see men that make a decent living and in some cases even millions but they're not willing to spend a couple of thousand dollars on a good pair of tefillin. Why? Simply, they say, listen, I already have one. They still work. Yeah, but if you have a pair of sneakers, you never say, listen, I don't need another pair of sneakers because the one I have works. If you have a car, you don't say, I don't need another new car, the newer model of BMW and Mercedes and whatever other brands that are out there because the uh, little Subaru that I have still works. No. What do you say? You want the best. You want the best car, the best watch, the best shoes, the best suit, the best house, the best everything. Except when it comes to tefillin. Worse yet is when people spend 500000 a million dollars or more that a Kadosh Baruch Hu gave them to buy a house. You tell them, listen, you need to put a mezuzah in each place. Oh no, we have some from our old house. Well, first of all, you can't take the mezuzah from your old house until another Jew moves in there and replaces them with his mezuzot or a goy moves in there and then you can take your mezuzot. Until then, you have to leave the mezuzot there, which means you have to get new mezuzot. You can't leave a house without mezuzot. Secondly, this new house you have usually is bigger than the last one. Has more rooms. Get some mezuzot. Okay, you know what? I'll go to the uh, local uh, EB equivalent Judaica store and buy $30 mezuzot. The whole house, 10 rooms, 300 bucks, I'm finished. You should be ashamed of yourself. You actually think you can get an avrech to sit there and write you a kosher mezuzah for $30 with the case? Here in America, if you're getting a mezuzah that's a good quality mezuzah for anything less than $130, $150, 
It's a miracle. People have done studies in New York and in other places checking people's mezuzot and literally say that over 80% of the mezuzot that they've checked are pasul, are not valid. I have a friend in Eretz Israel, and I told him this. He says, no, it's not 80%. I said, why, why, how much is it? Less? 30%? He goes, no, no, it's almost 100. I said, well, what do you mean almost 100? He says, because most of the people are buying mezuzot from stores and from different random places where they don't actually know who wrote it. So even if the writing itself doesn't have the mistakes, doesn't have the issues, and the cloth is valid cloth, when you don't know who it is, you don't know if the mezuzah is kosher and there's no way to find out. Why? Because it could have been written by some Korean. It could have been written by some idol worshiper. It could have been written by a Mechalel Shabbat. It could have been written by a guy that's answering his phone while he's writing the mezuzah. It could have been written by a person that does not know the laws of how to write a mezuzah, but he knows how to write. And therefore the mezuzah is not kosher. This is the only reason why we took it upon ourselves over the last several years to actually go search, find the sofrim that actually are righteous, that we know that most of their day they're learning Torah, they're not writing. But when they have time, they write. And we order from them the mezuzot and the tefillin, and the only thing I ask anybody that's thinking about uh, right, uh, buying tefillin is if you're not Jewish, don't order from our website. We're not allowed to sell it to you. And I know it's a little bit uncomfortable for some people where I tell them that uh, I can't sell them the mezuzah and I have to refund them the money because they're not Jewish. That's what the Torah says. Shuchan Aruch Paskins, you're not allowed to sell a mezuzah or tefillin or even a tzitzit or a talit to a non-Jew. It's no disrespect. This is our Torah. Same Torah that we're learning right now. It has rules. Once you become Jewish, Bezat Hashem will be happy to help you with it. But the important thing is to know that if you are a Jew and you are not even sure who wrote your mezuzah, you just know the price was right. You're not even sure who wrote your tefillin. You just know that you have it for the last 20 years. You, my dear friend, don't know how to make deals. Why? Because every single day you're putting your neshama at risk of declaring bankruptcy because you have no protection on it. You're putting the people in your house, your wife and children, at risk because you have no protection on them. So if a person wants to do kindness with himself, certainly he has to make time and she has to make time to learn Torah, learn Musar every day. That's going to wake up their neshama and keep it on fire, fire of Hashem each day. But also they have to make sure that when they do the mitzvot, they do them with mesirut nefesh, with sacrifice, with effort, and not just look for discounts. Furthermore, we see that after Yosef agrees with what his father says, this, I will not bury you in Egypt. Yaakov is not satisfied with that. In verse number 31, he says, Vayomer Ishav Ali, Vayishav Alo, Vayishtachu Yisrael al Rosh Amita. Yaakov says to Yosef, Swear to me. And he swore to him. And then he said, prostrated himself towards the head of the bed. Meaning that I asked you not to bury me, promise me that you're not going to bury me in Egypt. You said, okay, fine, no problem, Abba. I'll do what you say. No, that's not enough. Swear to me. Swear to me that you will not bury me here. Now we know the Midrash that we discussed earlier this week and last week and in previous years where this is literally prophetic by Yaakov who makes his son swear because he knows that Yosef is going to need this reason 
to convince Paro to let him leave Egypt and go bury his father Yaakov because he can't break a swear. But we also see the ways of tzaddikim and how they do business, how they make agreements. The agreements of the tzaddikim, the agreements of righteous people, either have a vow or a contract. Agreements that are in the air are usually ones that tzaddikim will not have such high value for because you're putting yourself at risk. If one tzaddik is dealing with another tzaddik, then their word is might as well be a vow. But if they're dealing with person that decent person, but not necessarily a tzaddik, not a Torah scholar, just another person, they're gonna actually have a contract with them. Why? Because this is putting everything we discussed today when we're friendly, when we're both on the same page. This is what's going to remind us of this day down the road when perhaps we're not remembering what that page looked like. Yaakov Avinu is telling us if you're dealing with a tzaddik and it's a very, very important deal, then you'll know that his word might as well be a vow. Because he knows that he cannot say things without fulfilling them. If you're dealing with someone that's not a tzaddik, make sure you get them to sign a contract. If you're doing business, you have some type of eteriska, you have some type of contract, do it. Why? Because it's going to be necessary. It's going to be necessary at some point. This is also good for us, and I can tell you that I've done countless deals in my life in business and in Torah whether it's the deals to purchase millions and millions of dollars worth of investments deals with different investors deals for all types of uh, things contractors and so on or it's deals with the world of Torah with my Avrechim with the Kolel the Dayanim the Tzadikim these deals, Rabotai, if you don't value them, why should HaKadosh Baruch Hu value them? Why should HaKadosh Baruch Hu value them? And anytime somebody values something, anytime somebody values something, they're going to want to know that uh, this is going to mean something, not just today. Now, Yosef, has two sons, Ephraim and Menashe. Ephraim and Menashe are about to get a blessing from Yaakov. And Yaakov says to Yosef that a Kadosh who spoke to me, he appeared to me in Luz. Luz is a special place where the Gemara says that the people of Luz didn't die as long as they didn't leave the city. People would live there for hundreds of years without dying. And the Gemara says there was one time somebody that lived there and all of a sudden he sees that his sons are dying. The neighbors came and started investigating him. What'd you do? Where'd you go? And they found out that it was because he lied. What did he lie? About something meaningless, or at least seemed like it. One of his wife's friends came to visit, and his wife was taking care of her body, taking care of her hygiene, and he wasn't uh, comfortable telling these details to, his, uh, to her friend that came to visit. So he told her that uh, she's not home. She's not home. Well, apparently... This was enough of a lie 
for him to lose this special protection, divine protection of the people of the city of Luz. The Gemara says there was also two special servants that were very beloved by Shlomo HaMelech. And one time he found out that the Satan, the Malach HaMavit, had the permission to kill them. So Shlomo HaMelech that had endless wisdom tried to bring these two servants to the city of Luz where the Malach HaMavit is not allowed to enter without a special code. But then Shlomo HaMelech sees that the Malach HaMavit was happy. And he said to him, why are you so happy today? He says, because I was sad yesterday because I needed to kill two people that worked for you, but I wasn't allowed to kill them here. I was only allowed to kill them at the entrance of the city of Luz. And now I'm happy because you sent them there, so I killed them today. We see also here that there's no way that a person can fool the Satan with just his wisdom. Even if he has the wisdom of Shlomo. Anyway, the parasha continues where we see that Yaakov is about to bless the sons of Yosef. But before that, Yaakov again brings a something familiar that seems unusual. He tells him after, he tells him that Akadosh Baruch Hu spoke to him in the city of Luz and gave him a blessing that will be fruitful and numerous. I also want to tell you that your mother Rachel, she died on me in the land of Canaan. What does that have to do with anything? Why, why, why do you have to mention this? Now, I mean, obviously, Yosef knows this. Why bring up Rachel? Now, you're about to lose me and by the way, you also lost your mother and I lost your mother. Why bring this? It's because it has nothing to do with touching his emotions, but rather bringing clarity to the forefront and continuing the point he started making where he says to Yosef, you know, you succeeded both spiritually and materially here. It wasn't just happenstance. You have to know that you are from. You're religious because I was. I, the one that was married to your mother, Rachel, we have a Masoret, a tradition a promise from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that so long as we follow His Torah, He will bless us and our descendants. And because I was from, I followed Hashem, that gave you the blessing, not only to live, not only to exist, but it gave you the ability to also follow in my footsteps and succeed spiritually as well. And your children, your children are also from, they're also religious, because you are. But you should know that if you want your kids to stay from, your kids to stay connected to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you can never slow down in your Avodat Hashem, in your servitude of Hashem. You have to be willing to sacrifice everything just like your mother Rachel did for the sake of serving Hashem. 
Many parents, Baruch Hashem, have kids. Unfortunately, some don't. And these parents, sometimes, they start off the relationship, start off the marriage as two religious couple, and sometimes they uh, start off as not religious, and then they do tshuva. But quickly people realize that once you get married, if you want your kids to follow in your footsteps of being connected to Hashem and following His Torah, not only do you have to be religious enough to send them to yeshiva, religious enough to give them a Torah education, but you have to make sure that you yourself are continuing to grow religiously, continuously doing more chesed, more tzedakah, more Torah learning, working on your modesty, working on your, uh, you know, your Torah learning. You have to continue growing. You can't stay the same. Why? Because your kids are growing. But if they see that you are just lackadaisical, and you're just you, then to them it seems like you were born that way. And you're not trying so hard, so why should they? Why should they try so hard to pray to Hashem if you are not even praying so hard? Why should they try so hard to learn Torah if you are only learning Torah when you have a chance? Why should they sacrifice so much for the sake of serving Hashem if you don't seem like you're sacrificing anything? You're more interested in who's having a party this weekend than you are in what's the next opportunity that I could take advantage of today to do more mitzvot. And what sometimes happens is that a couple does tshuva, they watch the shurim, they get strong, they have a good rabbi, but then as they have kids, they're focused on just maintaining life, making sure everyone has to eat, everyone has clothes, everyone has the things they need, So the excitement of serving Hashem that they had before the kids came slows down. And then their kids grow up in a house that's more on neutral and sometimes even reverse spiritually than the house that that was there before they got married. And the kids... They don't see their parents listening to Rabbi Reuven or any uh, Rabbi Ephraim or any rabbi that speaks strong anymore. They see them listening and watching different shows that perhaps are entertaining, helping them manage the house, helping them learn how to do business better. Maybe a shield to here and there by some soft speaker that is good with telling stories. They don't see the fire. So they don't have any fire being showed to them, taught to them. And their best bet is to learn from the local school, the local rabbi. And sometimes the rabbi in the school are treating kids in a very soft manner because they're kids. And they tell them nice stories, and they tell them different parts of the Torah. The problem with that is, is that if you're, if you, the parents, needed the fire in order to get yourself to serve a Kadosh Baruch Hu, I could assure you, the kids you brought to this world have the same spiritual genes as you, and they also need the fire. And if you don't give it to them, you'll be sadly disappointed at what ends up happening. And sometimes parents are surprised. I don't understand. I had the best rabbi. He helped me. But my kids are barely wanting to keep Shabbat. Of course. 
because you were raised and brought into the world of Torah by the fire of Kedusha and zealousness and emet. Your kids, they got their chinuch from, uh, you know, teddy bears that have a kippah on. They got, you know, they saw a few cartoons, read some books whenever they got a chance, if it was part of the homework assignment. They never did any extra Torah learning outside of school. Because the fire that you had died the same day that your kids were born. Not because of your kids, but rather because of you. So Yaakov Avinu wants to make sure that Yosef doesn't make this mistake. He says to him, your sons are so special. Ephraim and Menashe are like Reuven and Shimon. They're part of the tribes. Your other sons are not going to be part of the tribes. Why? Because your sons, Ephraim and Menashe, they thrived even in a country full of idol worship, even in a community without real Judaism. Surrounded by Christmas lights. Surrounded by idolatry. Your sons still thrived. And they thrived because you continued the fire that you learned from me. That you learned from my home. If you continue that, they will continue and their children will continue. But if you think for a moment that it's time for you to take a seat back, go on neutral, I already did enough. Or if your sons will think that since they came from such a religious household, their father is a tzaddik, their grandfather is Yaakov Avinu, they don't need to work so hard at their religiosity, at their servitude of Hashem. Don't be surprised if their kids are idol worshippers. Because if it's not the fire of Torah, it chas v'shalom becomes the fire of Tum'ah, impurity. Now, next we see the blessing that Yaakov gives to Ephraim and Menashe. And everyone knows the story of how the way that Yaakov gave the blessing to Ephraim and Menashe was unusual. Where his hands were crossed, he put his hand, his right hand on the younger son and his left hand on the older son, which required an explanation because Yosef thought it was a mistake. And he says to him, Yadati, bni Yadati, no, I know, I know what I'm doing. This is exactly what I intend to do. Because even though the older son will be blessed, the younger son, even more so. Why? Because while the older son will help you in business, the younger son will be a Torah scholar. Now, at first view, this looks perfectly fine in the world of Torah. The younger son will have more blessings because he will be a Torah scholar. He'll learn Torah his whole, whole life. Ephraim will be a giant in Torah. Of course he's going to get more blessings than someone that's doing business. But this conflicts with the blessing that Yaakov gave his sons, his other sons, especially when it came to Issachar and Zvulun, where even though Issachar was the Torah scholar, Zvulun got the greater blessing. Because Zvulun invested in Issachar. He was a businessman, and he gave half of his money to his brother Issachar so he could learn Torah. 
So wait a minute. So we see here that the businessman got the bigger blessing. So how come it didn't work the same way with the Ephraim and Menashe? Simple. In Ephraim and Menashe, it wasn't the same arrangement. Even though they were both following the Torah, even though they were both connected to Hashem, it wasn't the same arrangement as Issachar and Zvulun. Zvulun made major sacrifices his entire life in order to make sure that his brother learns Torah without any issues, without any worries when it comes to finances. He didn't just send him a $500 check every month and expect to get half of his merits. As Rav Moshe Feinstein says, the real Issachar and Zvulun, if you want the half the merits of a Torah scholar, is not if you just send them a couple hundred dollars or even a thousand dollars. The real Issachar and Zvulun is either you give them half of your money, you make 10,000, you send five to them, five to you. Or you take care of all of their expenses. Anything they need. They have to pay rent, you pay it. Electric bill, you pay it. Bar mitzvah for the kid, you pay it. Clothing, you pay it. Yeshiva tuition, you pay it. Everything you pay. If you are very wealthy and you want to pay all of their expenses and make sure that they live in comfort, Rav Moshe Feinstein says you're fine. You have Issachar and Zvulun. But if you are even a bigger gibo, more of a spiritual hero, and you say, no, no, no. Not only going to take care of their expenses, let them be rich too. I'm going to give them half my money. In the world today, people think that they can give an avrech, a hundred bucks, and they have half of his merits. There's nothing more deluding than that. Now, what is the benefit of having Issachar and Zvulun, aside from the fact that it brings endless blessings and parnasah, endless blessings in marriage, Endless blessings with your kids where if you respect Torah scholars, the Gemara says that your kids will become Torah scholars. But there's also something that's, if I didn't see it myself, I wouldn't believe it. I wouldn't believe it. Rav Ovadia, Allah wa Shalom, in Anaf Etz Avot, he writes a story in the name of Rabbi Chaim Ivolozhin, who lived just a couple of hundred years ago. Where Rabbi Chaim Ivolozhin himself did not know this until this happened to him. He was studying with his Talmidim one day on a very complex sugya in the Torah. I believe it was a Rambam that they simply couldn't figure out. And they're toiling and toiling for a week without getting to a solution. Anyone that's a real Torah scholar knows what it means, how much suffering it is to toil over something for a week and still not figure it out. If you've never studied anything for more than a few minutes, it's going to be probably difficult for you to understand that. But nonetheless, in anything else that you're involved in, in business and relationships and anything else you work very hard in and you still can't succeed, certainly that's a certain level of suffering. Not like someone that's a Torah scholar suffering, not getting the answer, but nonetheless, you understand that. You understand what that type of suffering is, of not succeeding. Anyway, Rabbi Chaim Ivolozhin is struggling with this, trying to figure it out. He prays to HaKadosh Baruch Hu to please help him. And that night, he says, I had a dream. In the dream... I see someone that used to live in our town. 
a farmer and the farmer comes to me and he has glow around him shining like one of the tzaddikim and he says to him rabbi i see that you're struggling with this sugya over here in the rambam let me teach it to you and he sits with me in the dream and he teaches me the whole thing after he enlightened me with this extraordinary torah lesson i asked him how do you know all of this torah you weren't known as a Torah scholar while you were living in the world. The average farmer, the commoner, says to Rabbi Chaim Ivolojin, you're right. In the world that you live in still, I wasn't a Torah scholar. I worked hard at my farm. I learned when I could. But certainly I wasn't a Torah scholar. But what I did do, is every time I got paid, I would put half in the hands of my family to take care of them and half in a separate box. And then every so often I would take that half that's in that box and I would go to the kolel and give it to the avrichim over there to help them. Now that I got to Olam I admit, the world of truth. They looked at my account and they saw how much sacrifice I made for the sake of helping Torah scholars. And they said, you invested all of this in Torah scholars? Now, all of the Torah that those Torah scholars learned and knew is all going to be taught to you in order to make you into a giant Torah scholar here in the real world. And they sat with me here in heaven and taught me all of the Torah that was part of my investment, that those scholars learned because they had the ability to learn now that they had food to eat, now that they had clothes to wear. And now... I myself became a Torah scholar. Rabbi Chaim Yivolozhin woke up from the dream shocked. He says, I always knew that those that invest in the world of Torah into helping people learn Torah, into helping people get closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, I always knew it's good. I always knew it's amazing. I always knew that they benefit in it. But only now did I have an idea of how much greater that benefit is than anything I've ever imagined. They not only get the reward of all the Torah that these scholars learned in this world and the next, but they also will get the knowledge of all of those Torah scholars. But this doesn't come cheap. This comes with extraordinary effort and sacrifice. It's certainly not coming to those people that are investing only a few pennies out of their fortune. I one time saw a guy that speaks a lot about how much money he has. And he has these big businesses 10 million here and 5 million there. And uh, he one day sent a donation. And I almost wanted to refund him the donation. I asked for permission from Rabbi Ephraim if I could just simply refund him. Because he made such a big deal about how much money he has to people on a regular basis that I literally wanted to refund him the money. Why? With all of the millions that he has, which is not a lie, he has millions. He sent $100. I have young guys and girls that are in their 20s. Maybe make a few thousand dollars a month. Send more than that on a regular basis. 
But this multimillionaire sends $100. And it's not just what he sent to us. It's a common thing. It's a common thing. So when I came to Robert Fryman, I said, listen, honestly, this guy, it's, it's embarrassing to accept such a donation from somebody like that. He has millions and he sends $100? A 15-year-old kid could donate more than $100. Why can't I just return it to him? He says, because you have to do him a favor. I said, now I have to do him a favor? He says, yes. And I said, what's that? He said, you have to accept the donation. Because although he has millions in this world, and although he has a keeper on his head, and he keeps Shabbat, apparently he's doing something to destroy his merits, where he has no merit whatsoever to actually donate to Torah, to donate to Kiruv. And all he has is $100. That's his merit account. So at the very least, if this $100 could be used for helping people do tshuva, helping people learn Torah, even though it's, there's not much you can do with it, hopefully it'll help him. Wake up. See the truth. We see from here, Rabotai Karim, that when it comes to investing into Torah, investing into Kiruv, there's nothing greater than that in the world. Now many people have their major investments in their house, in their portfolio, in their business, in their possessions, especially in America, England, Australia, Israel, different parts of the developed world, Canada. But when it comes to investing into the world of Torah, you see that uh, their accounts are very small and sometimes almost non-existent in comparison to their material wealth. This is not because they're stingy. Some people say, oh no, he's rich, but he's stingy. That's why he doesn't donate. It's not because they're stingy. I had a shear about this maybe seven years ago. When I first learned this, I wanted to cry for all of those people because their material wealth doesn't stop them from spending on other things. If they want to buy a house, they'll buy the best house. They'll buy a million, two million, five million dollar house. If they have less, they'll buy a five hundred thousand dollar house, but they won't. They won't be stingy when it comes to the house. When it comes to cars, they always want to have a car that's fresh and clean and no older than three years. And they have no problem spending a thousand dollars a month to pay for a lease. If they want some jewelry for themselves or their spouse, they're not looking for uh, jewelry in a uh, discount store. They're looking for the best jewelry. And they're looking for jewelry that's something that's valuable. And you will know it's valuable by simply looking at it. So they're more than happy to spend five, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50,000, 100,000, a million dollars, depending again on their Material wealth. They have no problem walking around with a $25,000 watch or a $250,000 watch. They have no problem driving a car that's worth $100,000 or $200,000 or more. They have no problem having a second or even third house just to visit once or twice a year. They have no problem going on vacation during the holidays of Pesach and the other uh, in Sukkot and spent $50,000 to take everyone on vacation. They have no problem with these material things and they're not stingy. In fact, even when there's charitable causes, whether it's supporting the local petting zoo or supporting to rescue dogs, perhaps even supporting some nearly extinct butterfly in Africa, they have no problem writing a check for a million or two million dollars. They're not stingy. If you tell them, listen, we're going to go to dinner and we're going to go to the most expensive restaurant where just the, 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 the first course 
is $150 a plate. They won't even flinch. In fact, they'll say, oh, maybe there's something better. Perhaps more expensive too. They're not stingy when it comes to buying material. They're not stingy when it even comes to charitable reasons. They're more than happy to send a university that's led by anti-Semites a million or two million or a hundred million. They have no problem whatsoever with that. They're not stingy. But when it comes to Torah, when it comes to publicizing Torah, when it comes to helping people do tshuva, if you ask them for a donation, or if it just so happens to cross their screen, it's not their wealth or their stinginess that will make their decision but rather their spiritual accountant that will evaluate how many merits they actually have and that will be the only determining factor of how much they donate. Meaning, if they have very little merits, then HaKadosh Baruch Hu is not going to allow them to donate to a place that actually helps people do tshuva. He's not going to allow them to donate to a place that actually publicizes Torah. He'll allow them to donate $100, $500, or some other minimal sum in comparison to all of their other expenditures, investments, and even donations. Why? Because in order to be a partner with HaKadosh Baruch Hu in publicizing His name, His Torah, and getting his people to come back home, and thereby earning the endless merit in this world and the next, which includes learning all of the Torah of those scholars that you invested into, and getting all of the merits and the mitzvot of all of those people that you helped do tshuva, in order for Hashem to take you on as a partner in creation, he has to want you as a partner. And for that, you have to have many merits. So if you find yourself having an easy time spending money on all types of things, except when it comes to helping people do tshuva, except when it comes to publicizing Torah, you should be worried, very worried about yourself. Because your spiritual accountant is telling you you're nearly bankrupt and perhaps almost homeless. Maybe you need to get a better plan to improve this case before it's too late. With that, Abu Tayyip Karim, we're going to get to the last segment before we go to your question, which is to tell you about this new campaign that's really an old campaign. But it's a new campaign because it's our last-ditch effort in this one. We want to not only build more than what we have. We have expansions taking place in Eretz Israel. We recently announced that we opened the Bedin in our Kolel. We have a, two Kolels now in Eretz Israel. The one that has the Bedin is in Givat Shaul. We're also now having some construction done to make the place nicer, more beautiful, more kavod to it, to the Dayanim, to make sure that this is a place people want to go to, to learn from, to be part of. The community in Israel is amazing. There are some great communities here in the States as well. And there are great communities all around the world. But where we are here in Florida, we feel like there is more needed. And we want to build a community here. But after years of trying, of looking, of signing contracts and negotiating, we realized that the only way we could really build a true Torah community with the yeshiva, with the kolel, 
with the synagogue, with a place that will be able to help the from from birth, the Hasid, the Baal Tshuva, and the convert, all in one place, all people that are looking to make the Torah their top priority in their life, while still living in the world and working and doing whatever it is. The way for us to do it is we need to buy a building. And to buy a building, Abutai, is something that we've wanted to do already for some time. We figured that maybe we could rent, maybe we can lease, maybe we can borrow. It's not enough. For that, we need your help. There are millions of dollars that are available for us to build a true Torah community. And they're in your pockets. They're in your friends' pockets. In order for us to succeed in raising all of this, two things are needed. Number one, for you to know that you need it at least as much as we do. For that, we made a video which will be publicized by Zad Hashem in the next 24 hours or less and will be part of this video when it's on YouTube that shows people what we've done over the last several years, what we've achieved as an organization in comparison to whatever else people are investing in spiritually, but more importantly, in order to give people an indication of what's possible. So the first thing that a person needs to achieve is the desire and passion behind this that's no less than ours. The second thing for this to work is that you need to elevate even that personal desire and passion that you have to donate whatever it is that you want to donate in order for you to go out there and encourage your friends, your family, your colleagues, and anyone else that you know, and anyone else that you even don't know, to do the same thing, to become part of this. Because this is a community that we're trying to build that will literally benefit anyone that wants to make the Torah the number one priority in their life. Now the reason why I'm saying that this is an old but a new campaign is simply because we don't have that much time to do it. In the past, we had time. We're out of time. If we're able to do this, Bezat Hashem, in the very near future, and we already start building, start buying, start moving forward, then we know that there's hope. And we know that there is a path. But if we see that the campaign is simply not moving, and we're not getting to our goal anytime in the near future, then we'll know that this is not the will of Hashem, And we simply have to continue what we've done without this. Continue publicizing Torah every week. Continue giving out books. Continue giving lectures. Continue doing all the wonderful things we're already doing. Continue helping the poor. Continue having more avrichim. And making sure that our kolels are fully functional, happy, and successful. And are reaching higher highs in the world of Torah than ever before. What we've done is amazing, and we're looking to continue it. But for us to take the next bigger step and build something that can benefit all of you that want to move here from around the world, and have asked me countless times, when are you going to build something? When are you going to open something? This is that last time. So Be'ezat Hashem, this is something that's going to require not just your generosity, your passion, but it's going to have to be bigger than anything else you've ever done with us in the past. You have to go out of your way to get others involved because for us to do it, we'll need a lot more than we've ever needed before. The campaign is now live on bhyeshiva.com. Over there, you'll see some of the basic things you've seen before, but in the next 24 hours or less, you'll see a new video that will show you some of these things. It's an extraordinary video that I'm sure you're going to enjoy, but most importantly, it's the type of video that if you're not excited to make Be'ezat Hashem 
your top investment in your spiritual account and even your material account there's nothing else that we could ever convince you with with that being said we're looking forward to seeing the feedback from all of you and Bezat Hashem seeing the results and know that after this we'll know exactly what the will of Hashem is now that I've said all of this we're looking to see what your questions are and Bezat Hashem will succeed okay Regarding benefit from idolatry for a Jew, Gentile, and in the process of conversion, does the halakha change if an atheist or agnostic person gave a person a gift on or around December 25th? Uh, well, as far as a gift, accepting a gift from uh, somebody, if they gave you the gift as a servitude of their false god, meaning they're saying that this is in the name of uh, my false god, whether it be Yoshke or some other uh, clown out there, then of course you can't accept it. But generally speaking, people don't give gifts in the name of any god. They just simply give a gift because now is the excuse for them to give people that they like a gift or people that they love a gift. So you can accept the gifts with no problem, whether you are a Jew, Gentile, or otherwise. A local Chabad rabbi has a Zoom class last year, and I remember that he wished everyone a happy new year. For the secular year. I was surprised. But since most of the Jews in our community were not brought up religious, I believe he uses this technique to be mekarev them. Is this okay? Um, again, it depends on your uh, ashkafa. It depends on the people. It depends where they are now. Not necessarily where they were. If they're all religious now, then uh, wishing them a happy new year is uh, certainly not appropriate if they're all living like Gentiles and uh, keeping, you know, virtually no mitzvot, then uh, saying Happy New Year to them is not appropriate, but it's understandable why he's doing it. So it depends. Again, it depends what, uh, who he's dealing with, what his strategy is. What is the Torah and why is it regarded so highly by Hashem? And it was that it was created before creation itself. Okay, so the the Torah is the instruction manual that Hakadosh Baruch Hu wrote before He created the world. This is the laws of God for His creation. Uh, the Gemara in Masechet Chagiga says that Hakadosh Baruch Hu wrote the Torah uh, by using black fire as the ink and white fire as the parchment. Uh, and he wrote the Torah before he created the world. And this Torah is the, in essence, the instruction manual for existence for the world that uh, not only the one that we live in, uh, but even beyond, the ones that is the eternal world. And uh, this, uh, this Torah, in essence, is a, uh, the, gives, this, uh, gives us, gives the world a uh, purpose. It's the will of God. Uh, it's what he wants, not only uh, from uh, you know from his servants, uh, but it's what we're obligated to do, and it's all for our benefit, not his, because he is perfect. Uh, now, if someone would ask, uh, you know, why would he do this? Sages teach us it's because of his endless kindness. He is good, and thereby he wanted to do good, and, and to do good, to give good. And in order for him to, uh, to give us good, he had to give us an instruction manual that's going to allow us to know what his will is, how do we achieve our purpose, how to serve him, how to achieve a purposeful life, a better life, and more importantly, an eternal life. And how to uh, achieve the other one, uh, the opposite, meaning how to ruin life, both here and eternity by uh, disobeying this instruction set. So just like, for example, a person that 
invents or produces some type of new technology, when they uh, uh, sell it in the market, that technology is going to come with an instruction manual. In fact, even if you buy a little tiny stand for your phone, it comes with an instruction manual. Even though the manufacturer knows that it's self-explanatory, how to use the stand to hold your phone, they're still going to send you an instruction manual to make sure you know to use it the right way. Needless to say, if you buy something more sophisticated like a phone or a computer or a light fixture of some kind or a microphone or, or pretty much anything else, a refrigerator or oven, you're going to get an instruction manual. Why? Because the manufacturer wants to ensure that you know what you got and how to use it properly. And in order for you to avoid misusing it, and thereby ruining it, and thereby thinking that the fault is the manufacturer's rather than your own. So they gave you an instruction manual. If you read it, good for you. Follow it, even better. You disregard it, suit yourself, you're at your own risk. The same concept comes with the Torah. If you read it, good. Follow it, even better. Ignore it, suit yourself, your blood is in your hands, as the Torah says. Is there a way for a person who practiced witchcraft in the past to do real tshuva? Yes. If they uh, have abandoned, their, first and foremost, they have to abandon witchcraft and never do it again. Uh, the, uh, the second thing they need to uh, make sure to do is to put themselves in a situation where they have a spiritual fence, if you will, to never go back to it. Meaning, if they know that they, uh, there are certain people in their life that are involved in it, that are, uh, you know, uh, talk about it, that have enticed them to do it, they have to completely disassociate with those people and disassociate with the places and disassociate with anything connected to their former life of witchcraft. The third thing is, is they have to cry to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and apologize for doing what they did. Uh, last but not least, they have to make sure that if they ever get a test, get a test of going back to it, they have to pass that test. And if they want to make sure that their spiritual account is crystal clean, then they have to publicize Torah to get people to do tshuva because the more people get closer to Hashem and do tshuva, the more they are staying away from such things. So in essence, it's the minimum requirement is four steps. The uh, best is five. Refuah Shlema to Dalia Romel. Bezat Hashem. What about the Zohar? I'm not really sure what you mean by the question about the Zohar, but you actually do remind me of something that is in this parasha that's connected to what we learned in the Zohar yesterday. Yesterday we learned in the Zohar that uh, Elisha Navi, this is in last night's lecture, Elisha Navi, that had Gehazi cheat and lie to him, told Gehazi that he can still get a share in the world to come because even though he lied, even though he cheated, even though he did all of these horrible things, because he served the tzaddik, he served and helped Elisha Anavi, that will give him a merit in having a share of the world to come after he suffers and his children suffer for a certain amount of time in this world and the next. The fact that he served the tzaddik is actually going to allow him to get a share in the world to come and not keep the door closed like it would be closed for if he didn't serve the tzaddik. Now, this actually is very interesting because many people that are anti-Semites and or ignorant of the Torah, when they hear certain 
teachings about what happens at the end of days and how the uh, Mashiach will come and after destroying the enemies of Hashem, the enemies of the Torah, the enemies of Am Yisrael, there's going to be a, the righteous Jews and there's going to be the righteous Noahites. And the righteous Noahites, what is going to be their job? They're not going to convert to Judaism. Your conversion is only before all of this. If you convert before it, good. But if not, you remain a righteous Noahide. Now what are these righteous Noahide going to do? They're going to serve the tzaddikim. And one of the sources is actually this week's parasha. But when people hear this, they're like, what? I'm going to serve these Jews? Look, see, they want world domination. Well, you're not understanding. You're not understanding what that means to serve the tzaddikim. In this week's parasha, in chapter 49, when Yaakov Avinu gives the blessing, gives the blessing to Yisachar, he says, chapter 49, verse 14, you look at the Onkelos, 14 and 15, he says, Yisachar is rich in possessions, his inheritance is between the boundaries, he saw the portion that he receives in Eretz Yisrael that it's good, and at the land that it produces fruit, and he shall conquer territories of nations and eliminate their inhabitants, and those that are left in them will serve him and pay him a tribute. Here, the Chachamim say, is one of the sources where the righteous Noahides will serve the Tzadikim. Will serve the Tzadikim. Now, why would this be a good thing? If you're righteous Noahide, I don't need to answer that. But if you're clueless or still learning or simply don't understand yet, the reason why serving the tzaddikim is the best thing you could ever do, whether you're Jew or Gentile, is because as we see from the Zohar Kadosh that we learned last night, Gehazi was a rasha. Gehazi was a liar. Gehazi committed Many, many sins, so much so that the Gemara in Masechet Sanhedrin, page 90, says he has no share of the world to come. But comes Elisha Navi and says to him, although you're all those things, because you served me, because you served me, I'm going to fight for you so you do eventually get to heaven. You do eventually get to Olam Abba. Meaning, the servitude of the tzaddikim is so extraordinary that it could literally take a person out of Gehenom. So if it could take a wicked person out of Gehenom, like Gehazi, how much greater can it do for someone that's already a righteous Noahide or someone that's already a righteous Jew? This is the reason why you'll see all of the great tzaddikim serve their rabbis with sacrifice. The Khatam Sofer served his rabbi to such an extent, famous stories about it, and enough etzavot and all over. Chazal talks about all the, uh, the, the, the great sages in the last couple hundred years talk about how the Khatam Sofer served his rabbi. So much so that when they were traveling one time and it was snowing, and it was morning. Khatam Sofer went off the carriage and started taking the snow in his hands to warm it up and turn it into water so his rabbi could do netilat yidayim. Just imagine how much pain he has to go through. Why? So his rabbi could do netilat yidayim. He could wash his hands. And Khatam Sofer became one of the greatest poskim in the last few hundred years. And the sages in the last couple of hundred years, like the Klosenberger Rebbe, says, I'm not surprised that the Khatam Sofer became so great. Look how he served his rabbi. Look how he served his rabbi. So although the people would think, nah, come on, why do you have to do this for them? You're not doing it for them. You do it for yourself. You do it for yourself. Akadosh Baruch Hu wants to help the tzaddik, he'll help him one way or the other. 
But if you have the opportunity to be the messenger, psh, it's for you, not for the tzaddik. It's for you. But that's the thing. People that are so full of themselves, they'll never understand that. They don't have the tools to understand it. But that's why the Zohar that we learned last night and then the Onkelos today helps us understand what it means to serve the tzaddikim. Serving the tzaddikim literally can take a wicked person out of Gehenom. How much more so can it do for someone that's at least trying not to be wicked and maybe even righteous? Father, I've donated for the benefit of deceased. Can it even benefit non-Jews, like the deceased relatives of a convert? If you're donating for the sake of uh, Kiruv, you're helping uh, publicize to uh, help people do Chuba, certainly you will help anyone that's involved, the person that's alive and the person that has passed on, even if they're not Jewish. Uh, now, whether it's going to uh, you know, take a person out of Gehenom and put him in Gan Eden overnight, again, it depends on the person, it depends on what sins they've made, it depends on the size of donation and commitment, it depends on a lot of different factors. Will it help? Can it help? Absolutely. How much it will help depends on these different factors. But uh, certainly it, uh, uh, it can help, and uh, it's something that uh, is a worthy uh, endeavor, to say the least. It's a big chesed that you would do for them. What can we do in our days if afflictions have befallen us from witchcraft and idol worship? Uh, generally speaking, if a person is following the Torah, the, the uh, you know, to, and they're really seriously, uh, you know, keeping Shabbat, they're keeping Torah, they're keeping mitzvot, they're keeping everything, uh, they'll be protected from such things. They'll be protected from witchcraft and all these other things. If a person is not keeping Torah, then. Uh, they already have a curse on them on a regular basis from HaKadosh Baruch Hu and all the tzaddikim up there because they're not following the Torah. Now, the, uh, you know, if a person is not Jewish, they don't have the protection of the Torah uh, like a Jew does. Uh, and uh, what they have to do is they have to do the best they can to publicize Torah, to serve Hashem, and uh, to uh, make sure that uh, they're doing as many good deeds as they possibly can uh, to uh, to change their uh, change their uh, fortune, uh, but uh, you know, as far as uh, is it does it work the same for Jews and non-Jews? No, uh, there's a special privilege for being Jewish. There's also a bigger responsibility, but nonetheless, as there is a uh, if with a bigger responsibility, there's a bigger reward. But uh, you know, if they're uh, affected by witchcraft and idolatry. Uh, the least and most common sense thing that they can do is run away from it. Same, the same answer that I gave the person that asked be before about if uh, they practice witchcraft in the past and they want to do tshuva for it, what could they do? First thing they need to do is run away from it. Run away from idol worship, run away from witchcraft, change neighborhood, change uh, scenery, change job, whatever you have to change. You know, sometimes when I talk to people that are in a forbidden relationship, a Jew with a Gentile, and they're ready to leave, but they're not sure, and so on. I tell them, listen, just leaving is not enough. You have to completely disconnect. You have to leave without discussion, with no negotiation. You have to just simply leave. You have to change your phone number. You have to change address. You have to simply disappear as if you were never born. That's the way to leave. Why? Because if you don't, then you could be sure that the Satan is going to convince you to go back there and convince them to go back to you. And in so many words, where you left is where you'll return to. If you want to leave, you have to leave like a uh, you know, like you're running away from terrorists. Even if they were nice, even if they uh, loved you, or they say they loved you, and all that good stuff. If you want to leave something that's forbidden, you have to leave like it's fire, never to return, and. Don't even tell them what the new address is or the new phone number is or the new profile. Change your profile, change your pic, change everything. You know, like a uh, witness protect protection program. And you're saying it's extreme? I'm saying it works. The other way, many times doesn't. 
local synagogue offered me a gift, and unbeknownst to them, I'm hoping, uh, the volunteer delivered it on Shabbat and rang the video doorbell. What is the polite diplomatic way that I can let the rabbi know that I don't appreciate this and kindly return the gift? Uh, you don't need to return the gift. Uh, there's no need to return the gift. And it's possible that the uh, uh, volunteer was not Jewish. And thereby he's allowed to uh, deliver this gift on Shabbat. Uh, you don't have to accept it on Shabbat. Uh, but you could certainly accept it after Shabbat. So there's no need for you to um, do anything about it. Just keep the gift and enjoy it and say thank you. The same thing that you would do if the post office delivered you a very important piece of mail with a check for a million dollars and they rang the doorbell on Shabbat. Now, if they rang the doorbell and you're in the middle of Kiddush in the afternoon, you're not going to like it until... The uh, post office person says, uh, excuse me, sir. Uh, yeah, I have a check here from uh, uh, XYZ Corporation. Are you, X, are you uh, Mr. Smith? What are you going to say? No. I don't want it. It's Shabbat. No. You're going to say, yes. They're going to say, okay, sign here. And you say, I'm sorry, I can't sign. Because it's Shabbat. But you can leave it here if you want. And guess what? It's exactly what I did. Not with a million dollars, but with a little package that I got in the mail on Shabbat last week. We were in the middle of Kiddush. Post office rang the doorbell. I went to answer the doorbell. I saw that it's the post office. I smiled at them. I said, how can I help you? They said, sir, we have a box for you. I said, thank you. I said, no, I need you to sign. I said, I can't sign. It's Shabbat. and I'm Jewish, so I can't sign. But if you want, you could leave it here. And then the very nice lady says, oh yeah, okay, I understand. Okay, no problem, sir. And she left the box there. And after Shabbat, I opened it up and I gave the little things that had, it was in the box to my kids. And everything was great. And no one fought. And no one was upset. And no one was uh, even um, rattled by it. Why? Because we live in a world where the vast majority of people are not Jewish. So we can't say, listen, they can't live their life because we're living ours. Now, if the person that delivered the box was one of the members of the synagogue that's Jewish, then I would say to to that person that delivered the package, you can somehow get him a USB or a shiur that we've made about Shabbat, whether it's a through a friend, through somewhere else, and send him a shiur so maybe hopefully he will do tshuva. But more times than not, these types of jobs that are on Shabbat uh, are not done by Jews. Or at least we hope so. Either way, there's no need to get into a fight or anything like that, or even upset. If someone gives me money on a uh, ex-mouse card, would it count as if they were doing it for the sake of their celebration? As I said before, even if they're doing it for uh, their uh, holiday, it's not their, uh, they're not doing it in the name of their false god where this is a sacrifice for their God. They're just using this date as an excuse to give people gifts. That's it. You're allowed to accept it. And you should say thank you. Uh, Rabbi, talking to the dead is forbidden, right? Uh, Not necessarily in all cases. If you're talking to the dead using witchcraft and all types of impurity, then yes, that's forbidden. Uh, Whether it's Ouija boards or all types of other uh, uh, witchcraft that's used to talk to the dead, all of that is forbidden. But if uh, someone that has passed away comes to you uh, you uh, you in a dream of some kind, there's no problem in talking to them. Uh, in fact, there is uh, sometimes special important messages that they can give you. But again, that depends on the person of, you know, whether a person is uh, holy or wicked and, and so on. But to go search out for them, that's forbidden. What if a person wants to donate so badly for the sake of Kiruv and helping the Rav's organization? Does that mean that I don't have the merit to do Kiruv? How can I get merits? 
Uh, well, if somebody wants to donate for, to the organization, uh, everyone can donate something. Everyone can donate something. I don't believe that there's a single person here that's watching my lecture now or tomorrow or next year that cannot donate to the organization. And if you tell me you can, you're a liar. Why? Not saying you specifically. Anyone that says no. Why? Because I have people that live in Africa. In Africa. I have people that live in India. In all types of places where they literally live in a third world country. Or at least their area of the third world. But you'll still see from time to time on Facebook and on YouTube. And of course you're not going to see what happens when they send it to me on other ways like PayPal and on the website. But you'll see publicly that they'll donate. Five dollars, four dollars, ten dollars. And guess what? I value those donations no less than if somebody sent me 10,000 or 100,000 tomorrow. Why? Because I know those people, they're doing the best they can. They don't have 10,000 in the bank and they're only donating $10. They have, I don't know, maybe $50 in the bank and they're donating $5. So if they can donate, certainly everyone that could afford the internet Needless to say, a smartphone can also donate. How much you can donate is a different story. But many times, I see that there are people that they believe they can't donate because they want to donate a lot. And since they can't donate a lot, they just decide might as well not donate at all. This is a... Advice that you're from the Satan. Satan is telling you if you can't donate a lot, don't donate at all. A person has to do the best they can. The best they can. If you're donating 10% of your income, whether your income is a thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars, it's still 10%. It's still 10%. And guess what? It's counted as 10% in the eyes of Akadosh Bahu. But if a person is donating 1% or half a percent or point point one percent then of course Hashem also sees that. Point is, is that it's all based on how much a person can actually do. Can actually do. Now, one thing I would suggest and actually request from any of you that are not able to afford, you know, larger amounts of money of let's say $50 or more at a time and you could only afford let's say $5 or or, or ten dollars at a time my recommendation to you is to donate you know uh a uh, instead of donating let's say every week five dollars or ten dollars or in some cases i see some people donating three dollars uh and two uh is to donate every couple of weeks or every month but a, you know a larger sum where instead of donating every time doing it once a month why because the fees from the merchant banks all of them whether it's paypal or flip cards or it's everyone all of them the, the transaction fees have a minimum requirement, number one. And number two, it's also operational cost for us. When we have, you know, bookkeepers and employees that have to uh, put all of this stuff into a system. So it takes time. So whether it's a transaction of $10,000 or $10, it takes just as much time. So if you really are truly looking to help us, it's better for you to make less transactions with more money. Meaning, instead of $5 four times a month, donate $20 one time a month. That's something that could certainly help. But either way, Back to the point at hand, which is donation. Somebody wants to donate. If they truly want to donate, they'll find a way. They'll find a way. Now, if somebody is stretched to, literally to the moon, they're living in debt. They can barely afford rent. They can barely afford, uh, you know, getting Shabbat together. And they don't have to donate, but they really, really want to donate. They can still donate. How? Simple. Number one, they have friends, they have family, they have colleagues, they have neighbors, they have a community. Go to those people and ask them to donate to our organization. And guess what? They will appreciate it. Why? Because everyone wants to donate to a good place. So if you tell them, listen, this is a good place, I know the place, they do good things. Guess what? People are always looking for good places. And usually, 
you get more donations from those types of people than you get even from the person that uh, donated themselves. Why? Because those people, they donate to a bunch of places, but they don't really know who's good. But if you're vouching for a place, it's a good place, that's already going to help them. And all of the money that they donate goes to your account also, your spiritual account also. In fact, you even get a bigger award than they do. So if you truly want to help us or anyone else out there, go and collect money for them. Go and get people to donate. Even help them with the donation, help them, uh, you know, whatever it is. Process the donation online, write a check, whatever it is. Go out there and collect the money. And plenty of people do it in all communities, Jews and non-Jews, and it's not so uh, difficult. Now, if you say, no, but I'm embarrassed, okay, so you're not, uh, you're not really as motivated as, uh, as, as you thought you were. You're motivated if you had it, if it was convenient for you. Now, the other thing that a person can do is if they don't have money to donate and they don't have the courage or, or, or the ability or, you know, to get from other people or they simply live in a desert and they don't have any friends, they don't have any family, they don't have any neighbors, they don't have any community. Their only community is a bunch of scorpions and snakes. And they live in the middle of the world by themselves, but they want to help. Then they need to get some of the lectures that we have and share it with people. If they live in a community with people, not in a desert, they can get some of the material, the Kirov cards, like this. Get these Kirov cards, especially right now, next week we're starting Shovavim. Get these Kirov cards for Tikkun Abrit cards. This is the auspicious time, starts next week for doing Tikkun Abrit. And give them out in the community. You can get them from our Kirov store for free. Go to kirovstore.org and you get these cards for free. Go give them out to people. Put them in the mailbox, put them in, the, uh, in their hand, put them in the Jewish restaurants, put them uh, wherever you can put them. Put them everywhere, in as many places as possible, and at the very least, you're using your time to do it. But if you say, I don't have any money, I don't know anybody, or I don't want to talk to anybody, and I also don't want to give any, 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 anything out, then the truth is that you really don't want to give. Unless the giving is uh, in, in your, uh, with your conditions, and that's not really desire to give. So, again... I'm not talking to anyone specific who wants to give, who doesn't want to give. I'm telling you guys that all of these different things are things that are, uh, uh, I, sell, I, I say to people all the time when they ask the same type of question, whether it's privately or otherwise, is that there is always a way to help us. There's always a way to help us. There are even some people that, uh, you know, that help us with their skills. They have technological skills, so they help us with their technological skills, either making videos, making posters, uh, helping with uh, different things. So some people volunteer with subtitles, different things. Other people we have, uh, you know, help us uh, with, uh, with other skills that they have. Whatever the way they can, they do. Point is, is that there's always a way to give. If you really want to give, there's a way to give. If you're not giving, it's because you don't want to give. Now, one thing I will say is that, you know, for since we're already mentioning all of this, is that there are some of you that are in touch with me more often than others. Some of you watch my lectures and maybe once or twice a year you send a question. Others send a question at least once or twice a day. Now, you have a much bigger responsibility to give and to help us than others. Why? You benefit more. You benefit more. Simple. If you're watching a lecture once a year versus someone that's watching every lecture, obviously the one that's watching every lecture benefits more. If you're watching every lecture and you only ask one question a year versus one that's watching every lecture and will ask questions every day, obviously the latter has a bigger responsibility to give. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu hates people that are ungrateful. And one thing that I have to say is that there have been times where people are so spiritually stupid that they literally ask me a question about their donations to other places. Where they'll tell me, listen, Rabbi, I just donated two thousand dollars to local Chabad. Do you think it was a good donation? And again, if this person was giving something of the same or more to us, you know, whatever he wants to donate there, by all means. I don't think it's an appropriate question to ask a different organization, but nonetheless, it's no problem. But when a person doesn't donate a penny to you, 
even though calls you their rabbi, says you're the best, you changed my life, but all of their donations goes to their local synagogue, this is a person that's spiritually stupid. You have to cry for them. I'm, al- I'm almost considered fasting for them because they're in such a bad condition. So again, make sure when you guys are watching the lectures that you guys really listen and apply some of these things to your life and really evaluate yourselves. Where do I stand? Am I really you know, someone that can benefit from this to apply this to my life? Am I, am I good? Am I, you know, everybody has to apply this. I, when I talk and I, and I teach, I also talk to myself. I evaluate myself. I know that I have a lot of work to do. Now, it may not be the same level of work as someone that's new needs to do that I already did, Baruch Hashem, but I myself also have a lot of work to do. Everyone does. So a person needs to know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu knows what's in your heart. He knows what's in your mind. That's one of our 13 principles of faith. So if you are a grateful person, then Hashem knows it because you are practicing gratitude. If you are an ungrateful person, Hashem also knows that. Hashem also knows that because you're practicing lack of gratitude. And if a person is really ungrateful, but pretends to be grateful, but just says they can't really act on the gratitude, then you should know. You're only fooling yourself. You're, you may be fooling the uh, different people around you, but HaKadosh Baruch still knows the truth. So every person that really wants to give can find a way to give. How much you should give, it depends what kind of eternity you want to have. If you want to have hell, you know, heaven, but like a little homeless heaven, like a little shack in heaven, just pretty much as long as you're not in Gehenom, then help as little as possible. Rely on your mitzvot to get you to heaven. If you want to have a very big heaven, then help as much as possible. How much is as much as possible? Literally, as much as possible. As much as possible. If you're able to help every day, help every day. If you're able to help, uh, you know, a, uh, you know, every minute, help every minute. Whatever you can do. And I can assure you, no one has ever lost as a result of publicizing a Kadosh Baruch Hu's name is Torah, and I am living proof of it. What are some of the ways that a person can serve you in another country? Same thing like I just said, to help the organization in different ways, whether it's uh, sharing the lectures or sharing skill sets. It depends. depends on a person. We actually have a, um, like a, like a PDF of different ideas of what a person can do in order to volunteer at our organization. Um, and uh, as I said, there's a lot of different things that a person can do. A person can raise money for us from different people they know. A person can share our lectures, help us with videos, help us with different skills that they may have. There's plenty of things that a person can do. If you want to help us uh, and it's, uh, money is not possible, uh, then certainly there is something else that's possible if you want it bad enough. Rabbi, can you please publish a pamphlet that we can give out to women explaining the importance of the laws of mikveh so that I can distribute it to my community? If someone is willing to sponsor it and take on the expense of uh, paying somebody to put something together and publicizing it and printing it, then by all means, I'm more than happy to do it. But to take on a whole new project and the expense that comes along with it is not something that I could afford at this time because we have to raise as much money as possible for these other things that are more priority right now. But if you or anybody you know is willing to put some money together to, uh, to uh, do a project like that, I'm more than happy to, uh, to uh, get it done. Is it okay to feel contempt for people who do evil? Uh, well, let's see. The enough it's a vote. Brings a Rambam. And he says in Lechot Shuvah, chapter 2, Alachah number 10. Now, of course, it's yet the Shmai that you asked this question and the answer is in front of me. And the Rambam says, it's forbidden for a person to be spiteful, refusing to forgive, and be pacified. Instead, he should be easy to appease and difficult to anger. When a person who wronged him begs forgiveness from him, 
he should forgive immediately, wholeheartedly and eagerly. This is the way of the seed of Israel and their pure and proper hearts. However, however, the non-Jews who have covered hearts are not this way. As it says by the prophet Amos in chapter 1 verse 11, and he remained angry forever. And so does it say about the Givonim who refused to forgive Shaul. In the book of Shmuel 2, chapter 21, verse 2, the Givonim are not considered part of the Jewish people. And so the Ramah Paskins in the Orach Chaim, uh, Siman 606, and one who takes hold of the character traits of the non-Jews is called a Rasha. So, a person needs to know that if the person that did bad things apologize for them you have no permission to continue being angry at them you have no permission to be angry at them if they're ignorant of the fact that what they're doing is evil being hateful of them is not going to help them nor is it going to help you if you want to help them as well as help yourself, it's better to educate them. But if they're aware of what they're doing, being evil, and they still continue to do it, then it's a mitzvah to hate them. So it all depends. If they said, I'm sorry, they didn't say, I'm sorry. If they know what they're doing, they don't know what they're doing. All of these conditions. Baruch Hashem. There are some Jews that think that Manus Friedman is good. What should we do? Nothing. We've made enough videos about it. You could show it to them. If they don't want to watch it, or they watched it and they don't care, by all means, their blood is in their hands. Nothing you can do. Is alternative medicine such as acupuncture, reiki, reflexology, and other such medicine with herbs, plants, considered as witchcraft? Uh, Depends, again, who's practicing it. Reiki, I do think, is connected to uh, some type of idolatry, but uh, as far as acupuncture, no. Generally speaking, acupuncture does not require you to uh, make any type of uh, uh, mantras or uh, serve anything. It's just putting needles in specific places in your body. Um, you know, as far as uh, herbs and things of that nature, this is what medicine has been throughout all of history. Um, so, you know, we've used herbs and, and, and different types of plants for the sake of medicine. Now, again, it's if a person is requiring you to, you know, burn a certain flowers or, or different types of incense, make all types of uh, mantras, say all types of words, worship something, bow to something, that's obviously... Uh, very problematic. But if a person is giving you medicine that's from, uh, uh, you know, different uh, plants, medicine, and you know, plants, uh, uh, herbs, and things of that nature, there's no problem with it. As far as uh, uh, changing uh, the, the the way that your body moves, stretching you, things like that, again, that's not a problem. But again, everything has to be evaluated, uh, you know, uh, accordingly, generally speaking, the only one that I know for sure that is uh, connected to idolatry is yoga, because that's what uh, Rabbi Yashif paskind and multiple other Chachamim have paskind already. But as far as uh, some of the other things that are out there, I would need to know a little bit more about them in order to tell you. But usually, you know, if you listen to what I just said, you could pretty much uh, know whether something is or isn't uh, at risk of being connected to idolatry and witchcraft. When is the rabbi making an event in New York? Uh, most likely not anytime uh, soon because uh, I haven't been invited uh, by anyone serious. I've been invited by people that are not serious that just simply want me to come and hope that people show up, but I haven't been invited by anyone serious. What's serious? Someone that actually sets up an event, puts together... A, uh, a place, a budget, uh, you know, and make sure that uh, a lot of people are going to come, whether it's New York or Los Angeles or Arizona or several of the other places 
that have contacted me uh, over the last several months about uh, coming to their uh, communities. I've had people from Arizona, from uh, um, California, from New York, and a few other places, at least a half a dozen places or more, have asked me to come. I always tell them to go and connect to, uh, or uh, send an email to events at bhtorah.org, and uh, you know they'll send you some questions, answer those questions, and uh, then we go from there. But usually, the people that have invited me, either they don't send an email, or they, uh, once they get the questions, they uh, don't respond. Or they decide that uh, it's, uh, they're not really looking to arrange an event, they just want me to attend. Like, I have nothing better to do with my life, and I'm just going to leave you know, all the work that I have over here, my family, and everything that I need to do here, and just simply going to come to your community and just hang out with you and drink coffee and maybe give you some divrei Torah. Uh, I understand that there are some people out there that do that. I'm not one of them. I'm not one of them. Uh, if you want to arrange an event, you're going to bring hundreds of people to the event where in a matter of 48 hours, I'm going to see a thousand people. Whether it's the same 254 times or it's a thousand one time, I don't really care. But if you can bring a thousand people in front of me in 48 hours, I'll go wherever you are. But if you simply just want me to come and hang out with you and your friends and 10 people, please don't waste your time. I'm not going to come. Uh, even family members that have asked me uh, to come uh, and, uh, you know, and visit. And visit. Just, you know, just come visit. Come to wherever. And visit. I'm sorry. I don't have that kind of time. I don't have that kind of time to, to visit. Um, it's, it's, just, it's just a lot to do. I have to, Baruch Hashem, learn and hopefully become something of myself. I have to teach. I have to run the organization. Baruch Hashem, the organization has employees all over the world, different time zones. I have my Avrechim. And Baruch Hashem, I have my family. There's simply no time. There's no, there's no time for me to do anything that's not going to be significant. Now, as far as doing events here in, the, uh, in, in Florida where I live, I haven't done an event in Florida in almost a year uh, because the uh, events I was doing here weren't, uh, you know, they were okay, but they weren't, a lot of people were simply preferring to watch at home. So why should I go spend $10,000 getting a place, getting this, getting all these different things, just for, you know, 20 people to be entertained. I'm not entertainment. I'm not entertainment. I'm never, I'm never interested in becoming entertainment. You know, and that's so, so it's a, uh, if, if people want to arrange an event, be partners in something where they're going to bring hundreds and hundreds of people to come and learn Torah and do something special, by all means, I, uh, I'll be on the next flight over. But if uh, people are looking for entertainment, there are plenty of other people that are entertainers. Go to them. Go to them. I'm sure they'll be very happy to take your call. Um, but uh, we're hoping that uh, you know, more serious people come and uh, get something together. Uh, do taxes count as a donation? What, meaning the money that you give to the government... Does that count as a donation? No. It's not counted as a donation. No. It counts as taxes. How many square miles do you think the community will need? Um, I, again, I, I mean, I think that the main thing that the community will need is a building uh, that could be a yeshiva, a synagogue, a kolel, something significant. Um, so it has to be a pretty big building, uh, not, you know, uh, 500,000 square feet, feet or anything like that, but you know, it needs to be 40, 50,000 square feet building. Um, and, um, around such a community, around such a building, you can build a massive community. You can build a massive community with, uh, with a lot of uh, people. Um, but, uh, as far as how big it would be, you know, we'd grow with it. We'd grow with it. gave you so much chizuk, do you recommend other people to watch it? Which one? 
I don't know. Oh, you're talking about something else. It's not my not something else. You're talking about some movie that you watched? I don't know. I don't usually recommend movies. But again, this, if it's a documentary of some kind that has uh, truth in it about Torah, about the Jewish people, then yeah, documentaries are something sometimes good. Uh, okay, that's it. Baruch Hashem. We learned. We addressed some issues. Uh, Be'ezrat Hashem. Everyone is uh, in a better position today than they were a couple of hours ago because we all have some Torah. Now, if you aren't, at least I am. But I'm sure that everybody enjoyed. I did. HaKadosh Baruch bless each and every single one of you that uh, you're going to have the Siyat Dishmaya to not only understand everything that we spoke about today and learn today, but also be able to apply it to your lives, apply it to your marriage, apply it to your, uh, you know, uh, raising your kids, developing families, your communities. And Bezat Hashem, HaKadosh Baruch will bless all of Am Yisrael to do complete tshuva and uh, anyone that wants to become partners with us to build the community uh, here in uh, Florida is more than welcome to uh, donate at bhyeshiva.org. Uh, and uh, we're really looking forward to uh, seeing the results of it because it's certainly going to uh, bring us uh, to make some uh, big decisions that uh, we've been looking to make already for a few years. So thank you very much for learning with me, for supporting. And again, don't think for a moment that whether we get to the mark or it doesn't get to the mark, I'm going to have any resentment. Again, it's no resentment whatsoever. I appreciate anything that everybody gives, just like I appreciate the $5 from India and from Africa. I appreciate the 5000 and the 50000 that other people give. I appreciate everything that you guys do. And uh, it's just really for us. It's just really a matter of where do we go from here? Do we continue on the same thing, same path that we're already on? Or do we expand? Will Hashem give us the tools to expand further? If yes, Baruch Hashem. If not, Baruch Hashem. Thanks again for everything. Hashem bless each and every single one of you. Make sure to tune in and share this lecture and that separate video that's going to be publicized very soon, probably in the next few hours maybe. Uh, and uh, try to get your friends, family, neighbors, whoever you can to contribute uh, as much as possible. Thanks again. Hashem bless everybody. Kol tuf. Holkanos asked him, what can we do to protect ourselves from Chavrei Mashiach? He says, Torah and Gemilut Chasadim. Even if somebody does a, a nice thing or learns a lot or anything like that, it's never compared to bringing one of Hashem's lost kids that's been lost for the last 3,000 years back home. One of the beautiful things that we have in our organization is that we have both Torah and Zikui Rabin because we have our Kolels, we have our Avrachim, and we also have our Kiruv that we do around the world. Our lectures reach every corner of the world, Baruch Hashem, in multiple languages, but of course, we always want to do even more. כל זה שעכשיו אנחנו נשמע את השופעה של המשיח. נמצא איתנו כאן האורח מפלורידה, יושב ראש הארגון, מזכי הרבים, הרב ירון ראובן. בעזרת השם כולנו נעשה ונצליח ונגדל בתורה ונזכה את הרבים ונעשה כבוד שמיים כמו שצריך. עבדתם המלאי התורה, תמשיכו, תהיו אור גדול. למען ישראל, אדוני אלוהיך, אדוני... בהזדמנות אני מברך את הרב ירון רובן שהוא זקן את הרבים ומחזיק תורה בעם ישראל בארץ ובגלל בתפוצות אשרי אמר שם חלקו שימשיך עוד לעשות כאלה וכאלה זכות גדולה מאוד שהוא מחזיק תורה בעם ישראל טוב שסים נוספו הערב לעם ישראל לכבודה של תורה להרמת קרנה של תורה וכל הדברים הללו ברוך השם הודות לידידנו יושב ראש הארגון שעוד לא ידע את ההפתעה שתכננתי לו 
while we have Kiruv work that we've done throughout the whole year, we also have the Torah that we're constantly producing more and more of, and last but not least, the uh, Chesed to feed the poor people in Israel. A very special thank you to all our amazing guests who show real Avat Yisrael by taking the time out of their busy schedule and sharing their ups and downs with us, all for the sake of Avat Yisrael. Yirgun Be'ezrat Hashem olech lechalek me'ot salem mazon one of the big things that we have, aside from this campaign, you probably see this post or something similar to it, is also we published some of the recent results that we have, or at least up to now, of the organization. And one of the reasons why we do this each year is because we want to make sure that our partners, our donors, our Talmidim, know where their money is going. Unlike everybody else that, you know, uh, says a lot, does a lot, we want to show you what these results are. I can tell you from my experience and a little bit of knowledge about the whole Torah world, I don't know of anybody else, uh, any other organization on planet Earth that produces produces dollar for dollar what we've produced over these last few years. This is nothing to be arrogant about. It's simply Siyat Bishmaya HaKadosh who helped us. We made every sacrifice that we can possibly make in order to, to make it happen. Producing nearly 300 films, publishing 32 books, our own books, giving out 154,000 books for free. Giving out 154,000 books is not a cheap endeavor. Anyone that wants to do such a thing has to be completely committed to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to his children, and most importantly, to have bitachon in HaKadosh Baruch Hu and his Torah. We also have fed over 160,000 people over these last several years. Each year during Pesach, the high holidays, throughout the year, we help a lot of people eat, help make sure that they have groceries, food, all types of things. And uh, you guys have seen many of the videos that are uh, that we've produced over the years to actually show you the people that are getting this food. You have here 160,000 people have eaten, nearly 300 Torah films. And then on top of all of it, we have 1.4 million USB CDs and cards that have been giving out for free. All of the work that we've done over the last 10 years on these USBs given out for free. Last but not least, 12,000 video and audio lectures available online in about 14 different languages for the world to watch for free. ארגון בעזרת השם לקח על עצמו את אחת המטרות הקשות ביותר בדור שלנו לתקן עולם במלכות שדי לא להסתפק במשהו אחד לעזור רק לאנשים מסכנים רק לאנשים ניצולי שואה רק לאנשים שלא מכירים את אלוקים רק לאנשים שאין להם כלום בבית אלא לעזור לכלל ישראל בכל מכל ברוך השם, חפץ השם בידינו הצליח למעלה ממיליון יהודים ויהודיות נעזרו על ידי ארגונים בעזרת השם. רק תדמיינו לכם איזה עוצמה היה לכל אחד ואחת מהשותפים שזכו להיות כל אחד כפי כוחו ויכולתו, לאיזה תוצאות הצליחו להגיע ולאיזה תוצאות עוד יצליחו. ברפור הוא שמח על לראות את השלטים, נעלה עכשיו למעלה, כמו הקצת האש, את הלימוד. ברוכים הבאים, אפשר לראות כאן. כולם יושבים לומדים, איזה רעש של תורה, איזה רעש, איזה רעש, והנה יש פה עוד בית מדרש, וגם פה יש, השם הכל עמוס. דמיון הזה הוא לא דמיון כל כך רחוק, כי כמו שהתורה אומרת, בפיך ובלבבך לעשותו, ככה גם בדבר הזה. כל מי שירצה, כל מי שרוצה או רוצה, להיות שותפים איתנו, עם הארגון הקדוש והנפלא הזה, שכל כוונתו לשם שמיים, להגדיל תורה ולהאדירה, להרים קרן התורה, לעזור לכל אחד ואחד מעם ישראל, בכל העניינים. כל המישורים, מהילד הכי קטן שצריך מטרנה וטיטולים עד האיש הכי 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 מבוגר שלעולם לא הניח תפילין ורגע לפני המוות דואגים להניח לו תפילין. אם גם אתם רוצים להיות שותפים בכאלה דברים גדולים בעשייה של תורה ועבודה וגמילות חסדים, ברוך השם, ארגון בעזרת השם כאן לצדכם, לשירותכם, יחד עם כלל ישראל. כמעט מיליון וחצי דיסקים, דיסקונקים שחילקנו, כל הדברים האלה בחינם, יותר מ-12,000 שיעורים, אז כל הדברים האלה, מתי שבן אדם רואה כמה ההשקעה שלו, אם זה בבתים, מניות, בכל מיני דברים, והוא רואה שהמניה עלתה 10% במקום אחד, ו-1,000% במקום שני, 
אז הוא מבין איפה להשקיע פעם הבאה. ואותו דבר פה, יש הרבה אנשים שברוך השם צופים את השיעורים שלנו, שיעורים של הרב אפרים, שיעורים של הרב שרביט, ושאר הרבנים והארגון, ועכשיו זה הזמן להיות שותפים בדבר הגדול שאנחנו עושים ברוך השם. an indication of what we can do in the future. So this is the time where we need as much of your help as possible to push yourself more than you typically do. If you typically donate a couple hundred dollars, donate a thousand. If you, uh, if you can afford uh, the uh, uh, 8,000, 15,000, 50,000, whatever you can afford, this is the time to do it because this is going to be the help that we have to help all of these Avachim, to feed these people and perhaps Bezat Hashem one day to get that building that we've been uh, wanting to, uh, to build here in, uh, in the United States to build a community. But the, all of these things require millions of dollars. If not now, then when?